All right, folks, I'm Rich Fowler. You're watching PBS Book View now at the Miami Book Fair 2016. So much energy here, so many books, so many authors. And I'm here with the next author on our list today, Lisa Napoli, who's written a fascinating book called Ray and Joan. Thank you. The man who made the McDonald's fortune and the woman who gave it all away. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Joan Crock, what a fascinating woman. What? I heard you just talking to someone earlier about how this election would have had her lit on fire. She's such an interesting lady. But I, when I read this book, though, I read first a story of the McDonald's empire and the, and the man who built it, Ray Kroc. And then I see uh, a story of a, of a romance between Ray and Joan and that sort of soap opera elements that's behind that. And then about her life as a philanthropist and then a maverick philanthropist at that. Three really distinct portions of this book. What was it about both of these people, but Joan in particular that attracted you originally. I really wanted to write a book just about Joan because I love strong women and I didn't know much about her. Of course, anybody who listens to public radio hears her name every day, but you never really knew where that came from. And I was a reporter in Santa Monica at a public radio station there and I went to cover the fate of a big peace sculpture that it turned out she'd funded anonymously and it made no sense. So I went looking for puzzle pieces and I couldn't find too many, so I decided I would write a biography since there wasn't one out there. But her strong passion and her compassion were what just kept me sticking with the story. Yeah, so you, you talked earlier about, in the book too, about, we'll get into McDonald's in a minute, but the McDonald's Foundation is a fascinating thing. There weren't like company and corporate foundations early on. No. And Jones somehow became head of that foundation and turned it into what became her life's work, philanthropy. Yeah, yeah. How did that all happen? Well, Joan was Ray's third wife. She was much younger than he was. And when Ray and his people took McDonald's public in 1965, he became instantly a multi, multi-millionaire. So they did what people now typically do, which is shelter some money to give away. And once he did finally marry Joan in 1969, she didn't want to sit back and be what we would call disparagingly a trophy wife. She wanted to do something. Uh, she was from a generation where women didn't typically get educated, so she hadn't had that chance, but she was incredibly smart. And she saw this foundation, this, this money, and she wanted to help deal with issues pertaining to, as she said, the human condition. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she did. She, she saw this avenue and took yeah, you talk about finally marrying, when they finally got married, their courtship was a long process. And it started with back when she was, I think, with another franchisee's, uh, she was married to another franchisee, and Ray was coming in to help the McDonald's brothers. What a strange story that was. It you is. talk soap opera. It is total soap opera, as was the beginning of McDonald's itself. But yes, Joan, actually, her husband became a franchisee, probably because Ray took a look at her when he was shopping franchises around. And took a shine to her and his, her husband happened to become a franchise probably because of his attraction to her. So mm. it's even more soap opera. Uh, but not even, you know, I know we say that in a, in a fun way and I hate to d disparage them because she was such a formidable person and the drama between them really does mirror the drama in the unfolding of McDonald's and to braid them together was really a fun challenge yeah. as a writer. Well, and then th their relationship was volatile though. Yes. I mean, and she was a strong woman, as you, you mentioned. I mean, and she, she directed a lot of the early days of like, you talk about the fresh food. There was no fresh food movement, but Joan was sort of pushing in that direction early on at McDonald's, who to thunk? Joan was very responsive to the fact that Ray was a big drinker and Joan didn't want to leave him. So she stayed with him and realized she couldn't reform him. So she took her, what she learned in Al-Anon, which supports families of drinkers and coalesced the movement that really was burgeoning in the 70s mm -hmm. uh, to get people to look at alcoholism as a disease that impacted the entire family. And at the same time, she sort of stepped back from it McDonald's. She never, once she helped her first husband with his franchising movement, um, she stepped away and just kind of went off in many, many other directions mm -hmm. with her philanthropy. You mentioned earlier that like you hear Joan Crock's name on NPR. She gave some 225 million or something like that as an endowment to NPR. Um, and maybe some people know her from that. But you also write that she doesn't get the credit that she deserves as a give it all away person. You hear about right. Warren Buffett, you hear about some of these new millionaire and billionaires that are now working actively to give away their, their money. Right. Why didn't, doesn't Joan 
get the credit. And we'll talk about some of the things she did, but why doesn't she get the credit for what she's done in I the think, philanthropy world? I think it's partially because she's a woman and because she didn't earn the money herself. So I think in the, ca the case of Gates and Buffett, you know, they're well-known men in society when they made these proclamations. But Joan was more uh, to the side. She wasn't a front and center person. She wasn't a prominent person until she started giving away lots of money. And I think that's I think that's why. You know, she gave she gave a lot of it away anonymously. anonymously. That talk about the, the process for how she determined where the money was going to go, and was there even a process? It, that's what's so fantastic is that there really wasn't. She had for a long time, once Ray died, she took over the foundation, the formal foundation, which of course is very rigid and stringent in how money is dispersed. But when she closed that down, and even before she closed it down, if she saw something on the news that disturbed her. She would hear about the zoo needing a new wing or a person. Grand Forks thing. Grand Forks. Which is like she's the queen of Grand Forks or whatever they call the her. The angel of Grand yeah. Forks. She swooped in when she saw all this terrible devastation because of the fork, the floods in Grand Forks years ago and made sure that they got money so the people had at least a little bit of cash to get them through the worst times in the very beginning. So time and time again she responded to something most notably to me in 1984 when a gunman and went into a McDonald's in San Ysidro, California, not far from where she lived, she swooped in and started a victim's fund before McDonald's even responded and insisted that a piece of the money went to the gunman's widow mm -hmm. and his two children because she felt such compassion for them. So she was radical and unorthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, as a writer, blew me away and yeah, compelled I mean, I me to keep going. What, what I loved about the story as I was reading it was the fact that this is strength that this shows such a strength of character to do this without anybody saying this is good for PR, this is good for your right. tax shelter, this is good. She didn't always even get credit for the money she was giving away. It was just the first instinct for her to yes. give that money away. Yes, and the fact, like you say, that she wasn't worried about corporate social responsibility or standards or annoying someone, and she often did annoy people. Many of the McDonald's executives from back then were peeved by her. Uh, that was not something a woman at that time in particular would do, mm -hmm. um, but that didn't, didn't stop her. There's a lot of progressive causes, causes in Joan Crock's life. Um, I'm not sure what Ray's politics were compared to hers, but she was one of the first people to put a lot of money into AIDS and other things. Yes. What was she politically all about, Joan Crock? Well, so much of about her is, is paradoxical. She said many times through her life that she was a registered independent, yet she was the first person to give a million dollars to the Democratic Party. Um, she supported Mondale when he was running for president, and she was in major no-nukes activist as well. So she it was strangely political. There were politics, I guess, it threaded through many of her gifts, but she wasn't, when, when someone floated her name as a possible uh, Senate candidate in California where they wound up living later in life, she said, no way, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So it, it's interesting juxtaposition for her, mm -hmm. I think. So she did live a high life though. It wasn't as if she was, you know, living a, a pauper's life and giving away all of her money. She, she enjoyed the spoils of, of a wealthy life, but wanted to share it all. Can you talk about that sort of dichotomy? That's the other thing I love about her is she wasn't an ascetic. Um, she was living large. She loved to gamble. And her prized possession, even though she had jewels and fabulous art and had built herself a spectacular home, was her jet. And the reason she loved her jet was because it allowed her to go wherever she wanted to go and allow other people to go where they needed to go. So she used it for things as frivolous as gambling trips or going to see a friend in a show on Broadway, but she also ferried bodies to the family plots on on her jet, um, very unusual use of her car of her jet, almost like you had a car. Um, I love that about her because that was obviously what's the most opulent thing in our society that you can own besides a Gulfstream jet with a crew on call at all times. But she used it in the service of so many different tasks. Like when she gave the money in Grand Forks, she swooped in her friend, uh, the former mayor of San Diego, Maureen O'Connor, with the check. Um, so it was sort of like a mission of mercy, this, this plane, and used in so many ways, and yet it was the height of opulence. Yeah. And the minute we have left, you know, you think about um, some of the mavericks out there, like Mark Cuban and others. Um, right. 
Um, and there's an in, they're having an influence a little bit on sort of the young millionaire, billionaire crowd, right? I mean, they want to sort of be seen as a different. They don't want to be seen necessarily as trying to keep it all together. Did Joan care about how she was perceived ultimately? Was that ever an important thing for her? And you see other women coming up who are coming out of that same mold. I hope so. I haven't. I'm sure they're out there. And I really hope that Joan's story inspires other women and people in general just to give because, uh, yeah, she gave without concern. And that sometimes got her into trouble. But that's what, to me, makes her so great. She mm -hmm. was her own person. Yeah. Well, the book is Ray and Joan, the man who made the McDonald's fortune and the woman who gave it all away. Completely fascinating couple. Uh, and for anybody who is interested in the rise of big business in a company <laughs> like McDonald's Fortune 500, not to mention uh, the strong woman at a time when that was something you didn't necessarily read and, see, read and see about, fascinating book. Thanks for being here. Lisa Napoli. Thank you. All right, folks.